in Europe. We are facing the worst energy crisis in at least 50 years. We compare this with the first oil embargo in 1973. But the current crisis feels even worse than that because this time is a much wider energy crisis. The crisis is really huge in terms of the price. The price impacts homes, businesses, industries and the economy. We see energy prices breaking record after record. The consequences for households and companies are not sustainable anymore. We've got less customers coming in. Our margins are smaller. It's a perfect storm for disaster. European economies, they are on the brink of recession. So the winter uh, is going to be tough around here. Over the next few months, Europe will face a high stakes puzzle. How to keep the lights on with a substantial portion of its energy supply suddenly gone. To do that, countries are going to need to manoeuvre the balance of supply and demand swiftly and precisely, and make hard decisions about how to minimise the pain of this winter and the next. Beyond that, Europe could be forced to reconsider its reliance on fossil fuels in what some see as the beginning of a fundamental transformation of its energy system. The old pattern of responding to every fossil fuel crisis with a grab for more fossil fuels is simply not tenable anymore. If there is to be a silver lining from this terrible, traumatic year here in Europe, it is that it has reset the energy debate forever. The history of Europe and Russia on gas goes back to the Cold War, when Russia was not Russia, but the Soviet Union. Slowly, Europe got, in some ways, addicted to cheap Soviet and Russian gas. It was plentiful, it was affordable, was round the corner, and it really became the backbone of the European industrialization. Europe uses gas for heating, for industrial production as a feedstock and as an energy source. It uses gas for power production. Natural gas is really, really important for these economies. Flows of Russian gas to Europe only increased after Putin became president in 2000 and doubled down on Russian gas production via the state-owned energy company Gazprom. It's this gas field that's the basis for Gazprom's power and wealth and in turn Russia's revival as a power on the world stage. By 2021, the EU was getting more than 40% of its natural gas imports from Russia. But looming behind all that cheap energy, there was a problem. While Russian gas was cheap, it was also a tool for the Kremlin to exert political and economic pressure. In this particular crisis, Vladimir Putin saw the opportunity to use gas as that tool to put pressure in Europe. For a lot of people, the energy crisis began when Russia invaded Ukraine in February, but for us in the energy market, it began before that. September, October of a year ago, that's when Russia started to reduce supply of gas. Europe is facing a worsening energy crisis ahead of winter. Gas prices have reached record highs and supplies are running low across the block. Russia blamed difficulties, it blamed problems, but surely it was cutting supply into Europe. That meant that prices are starting to go up, reaching very soon record highs. The situation got much worse into 2022, particularly after the invasion of Ukraine. Air raid sirens in Kyiv, signaling that the full-scale invasion of a European country was well underway. We saw uh, prices skyrocketing because uh, everybody was afraid of how the battle would actually impact infrastructure. And then we started to see uh, the Western countries imposing sanctions. Putin chose this war, and now he and his country will bear the consequences. That's when we first started seeing supply cuts from, from Russia to European countries. Some hoped Russia would continue exporting gas to Europe in spite of the war. But over the course of the year, that hope faded. 
supplies were gradually cut over the summer on Nord Stream, the big gas pipeline that brings fuel from Russia to Europe, and then finally stopped. And the market realised that really those supplies probably weren't going to come back. By late August, natural gas futures spiked to more than seven times what they had been a year before. Then this happened. Sabotage at sea, that's what President Biden is calling the leaks and explosions on the Nord Stream pipelines. This is natural gas, highly flammable natural gas that is bubbling to the surface. It remains unclear who carried out the suspected sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines and why, but the leaks sent an unmistakable message about the vulnerability of Europe's energy infrastructure. It was seen as the start of a new chapter in this energy war. Everyone then thought, what if it's not a Russian pipeline, but it's a pipeline from Norway into the European Union, uh, bringing gas supply from the North Sea. If that was hit, Europe simply will not have not nearly enough gas, not even for the winter, even for the fall. Now, Europe is headed into winter with sharply reduced energy imports. Whether some countries will make it through without severe power cuts will depend on whether supply and demand can be balanced, and on how cold it gets. For some of the most vulnerable citizens, the stakes could be life or death. If we have more people unable to afford to heat their homes and sitting in the cold, then experts expect there to be more deaths. Below 13 degrees Celsius is when you can have heart problems. You know, these are problems that affect more the elderly or people with existing conditions. However, cold does kill people. And it worries me for the economy, you know, for the European economy. You know, we have not enough energy, rising interest rates, huge inflation. Energy this crisis has revealed is so integral to everything. In hopes of averting a worst case scenario, European governments are taking action, addressing both sides of the dilemma, supply and demand. On the supply side, it's trying to grab as much gas as it can find in the international market, particularly of liquefied natural gas. This is the big uh, gas carriers that ship gas from places like Qatar and the United States. Liquefied natural gas has really been the hero. We've seen a very strong flow of LNG entering our ports, in our terminals. The problem is that Europe now faces actually a lack of infrastructure to import that gas. We can import gas from elsewhere, but we're very limited by the amount of LNG import facilities that we have in place. And at the moment, across Europe, there are 25 of these facilities being planned. We'll have the first couple this winter, but through next year, we'll have more. And that will definitely help. But to really get imports scaled up, new construction will be needed not just on the European side, but on the US side as well. One of the dates that people look forward to is 2026, when a lot more US export LNG capacity comes online. That is a long time away, and that's the problem with building infrastructure. It takes time. In the meantime, other, more contentious sources of energy will have to make up the shortfall. The energy crisis in Europe has prompted what we are calling a coal comeback. These countries were really trying to get rid of this, the most pollutant source of energy. And in the short term at least, it won't be able to do so. In Germany, which has struggled to phase out coal in recent years, the energy crisis has prolonged the practice of raising small villages to mine the lignite coal buried underneath. Imarat was flattened to allow for the expansion of this massive open cast coal mine which supplies a local power station that is one of the most polluting in the whole of Europe. So in the short term we're going to see probably uh, emissions rising and this can really slow down European plans to become climate neutral. We are seeing also uh, a nuclear comeback in some countries. Even in Germany, where nuclear 
uh, has been such a taboo, now the government has decided to extend the life of uh, its remaining nuclear power plants. Countries like the UK and Sweden are also hoping to bring more nuclear power online, though any new plants are years away from operation. In the short term, though, nuclear is proving more of a hindrance than a help. In a case of spectacularly bad timing, about half of France's massive nuclear fleet is currently shut down for repairs. Normally, with that huge fleet of nuclear energy, France has been a proud exporter of power to the rest of Europe. They're now expecting to need imports of electricity, and that changes the dynamic for all the countries surrounding France, so the UK, Germany, Spain, everybody is going to have to send imports to France, and that means that they've got less electricity themselves. With no immediate way for Europe to make up the shortfall in energy supply, the other side of the equation comes into play, reducing demand. Many countries have drawn up guidelines for households and businesses to voluntarily reduce their energy use, such as limiting heating in offices, turning off lights at night, and using clothes dryers only at certain times of day. The single most important measure that European families can take is reduce the thermostat down. If we reduce the thermostat to 19, probably something like 5 to 7% of European gas demand could come off. But much of the necessary reduction in energy demand won't need any special push from governments. It'll inevitably happen simply because prices of energy and everything else are so high. We are seeing some uh, companies reducing output. Some of them might not ever be able to get back to the production levels from before the crisis. Most of all the products have risen in price. I'm going to say everything's up minimum 15, 20%. Our margins are getting smaller, but also the footfall, the customers coming in is getting smaller. The people need more money to live because everything's going up. You know, like you say, a lot of businesses, they'll just, they'll just call it a day. Europeans are also feeling the extra squeeze from their home energy bills, creating a dire economic situation for many low- and middle-income people and sparking cost-of-living protests throughout Europe. Don't pay UK means don't pay your energy bills. Uh, our goal is to get a million people striking. Tous les prix augmentent, uh, sur les prix énergétiques, uh, mais aussi uh, les prix dans les magasins, donc c'est important d'avoir plus de salaire. In response, some countries have decided to partially subsidise their citizens' heating and electric bills, which could cost governments hundreds of billions of euros or pounds for this winter alone. It also introduces problems for the supply side of the equation. The problem with the subsidies and the price caps for the families is that they stop the price signal from reaching households, and it means that families do not have the incentive to save, to economise, to try to consume less than they did last winter. So it's a very difficult and precarious equilibrium in between helping families and shielding them from the impact of high prices and letting the market work and reduce demand so there is enough gas to make it through the winter. One of the things that you could do is protect the most vulnerable families, the poor, the working class. But at the moment, most European countries is just literally protecting everyone. Europe may not have found the perfect solution to the supply and demand puzzle, but as winter approaches, it's finally caught a few breaks. Many countries have successfully filled up their emergency stores of natural gas, bringing gas prices down from their late summer peak. And forecasts are predicting relatively mild winter temperatures. Probably Europe will be able to make it through the winter. The problem is what happened next year into 2023 and the winter of 2023-2024 without any Russian gas next year, next winter looks absolutely horrendous. There is not enough gas out there in the LNG market to replace imports of Russian gas for a full year. This is a permanent change in the way that Europe has bought gas, and that means permanent higher gas and oil prices. Many are hoping that change can push Europe in a direction it needs to go anyway, towards more renewable energy. 
in light of this year's crisis, a push towards renewables, electrification and energy efficiency is more attractive than it's ever been. What we are seeing this year is that fossil fuels are not the way to have a secure energy system. That actually clean energy with renewables at its heart are also going to be more secure. It's not easy to roll out a secure clean energy system. Very, very difficult. Lots and lots of work to do, innovation to happen, uh, investment to happen. But it can be done. Renewables are already helping to turn the tide. A study found that the wind and solar capacity that was added between March and September alone saved Europe the equivalent of $11 billion in avoided gas imports. We are seeing that authorities, governments, are raising incentives for the construction of more clean wind solar power plants. And Europe is still is promising and targeting to be climate neutral uh, in the mid-century. Whilst fossil fuels have, of course, powered incredible improvements in living standards, they've also led to war after war, crisis after crisis, but in the past, we've had no alternative. This time, we have line of sight towards an energy system that is sustainable, affordable, and secure. And if there's going to be anything good coming out of this year, it is that vision and accelerating towards it.